All right. Thank you for joining us for Wednesday night service. Uh, we are going through, we got just a couple of weeks left on our statement of faith that we're going to cover. There's no way we can cover uh, all the things that we believe uh, in just a short time, uh, like we're doing here, about uh, 14 weeks or something like that. But uh, just thank you for being a part of, of this uh, time where we can do some study together, walking through the scriptures to find out what it is that Buck Creek Baptist Church truly believes on so many various uh, issues, some doctrines, all right? Now, what we're uh, doing mainly during this time is focusing on the essentials, all right? The things that are non-negotiable to us, the things that we clearly see uh, in the scripture, all right? Which means that there are going to be a lot of things that are uh, uh, non-essential, okay? They're still very important, but uh, they're not worth, uh, you know, they're not hills to die on, so to speak, uh, because there's so many different traditions and everything uh, that people put into the scripture. And so uh, thank you for joining us for this. Uh, today we're actually going to talk about uh, part one of uh, the family. All right. Uh, what does the scripture say about the family? And so today we're going to focus mainly on marriage. And the next time we meet, we're going to focus on uh, the family as a whole with children involved and everything else. Okay. So uh, with that said, I want to give a, just a few announcements, things that are going to be coming up uh, very soon. Uh, and this is going to be so important for our church uh, moving on because, as you know, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we got, we're not 100% yet, but we're pretty much getting 100% back uh, with all the different ministries, we now have nursery open, we have uh, children's ministry, we have our youth ministry is back Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. Uh, so just want to encourage uh, uh, the whole family to get involved. All right, we have our 9 a.m. Uh, Life University for all ages. It's now available. The children's ministry is rocking. Uh, great. Uh, we already had a good showing even on the first Sunday in our youth ministry. So, excuse me, <coughs> Woo. Uh, yeah, you want to be back. You want to see those things uh, that are happening. And man, uh, a lot of people have put uh, some great effort into uh, preparing uh, to teach, to educate, to disciple your children and youth and adults, all right? On our uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Life University, we got two great classes that are going on. If you want to study a book in the Old Testament, uh, Joe is doing the book of Isaiah. And it's calling about people to, to, to find comfort in uh, our, the one true God. And then Lamar is actually teaching the book of Hebrews, where believers can be confident in what they believe. All right, so really good stuff going on. Uh, a couple of other things I want to highlight. Number one, uh, uh, Kenny and I, and we're just walking through the leadership of our church and looking at the pulse of not just our church, but church as a whole, as well as our nation and world as a whole. And what we keep going back to is what's God, what God is telling us uh, to go back to the basics. And that's why we've started the good book, where we can go to uh, the Word of God, which is like which is like food to us. How many of y'all need food? All right. Well, just as much as we need food, we need the intake of the word of God. Jesus himself said, uh, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So now we're getting Bible intake. Uh, connect to a small group where you can take that Bible intake and apply it uh, to uh, your community's life. All right. So we're doing Bible intake. The next thing not only do we need bread, we also need breath, don't we? And so uh, you're going to start seeing an emphasis, a very strong emphasis on prayer. All right, on prayer. As a matter of fact, uh, Friday and Saturday, October 2nd and 3rd, we are having a 24-hour prayer vigil. As we really get prepared for God to, to do a renewal in Buck Creek Baptist Church, uh, I don't know of anything good that happens without prayer, okay? Without inviting God, not only to be part of the process, but for God to take over, okay? Uh, everything, to take over the church. Remember, it's his church. Uh, his church will prevail against the gates of hell, all right? Uh, if it's my church, if it's your church, it won't do it, 
all right? It's got to be Jesus' church. And so we want to usher prayer into what God is going to be doing as he renews and revives uh, the church. So we've got our 24-hour prayer vigil, October 7th. For those of y'all that have been missing Wednesday nights, I'm here to tell you, October 7th, we are kicking Wednesday night back. It's going to be different, all right? Normally, we're very heavy with uh, teaching during that time, all right? Teaching will still be an element of our Wednesday nights, but our focus is going to be church-wide prayer. We'll tell you more about that as we, as we get closer to the event, but we are going to be having prayer services, okay? Uh, now, you may have different ideas on what prayer services is, but I want to challenge us as a body of Christ. All right, think about, uh, as I said earlier, nothing great happens without prayer. That's true. When you look at Scripture, the only time something good happened, even with people who weren't all that good, it was after they prayed. good example of that would be um, Samson. Remember Samson? All right, Samson, he had a pretty messed up life. Yeah, he had a commitment to God through his Nazarite vow, which means there were three things that he was not going to do in order to honor the Lord. Well, he uh, reneged on all three of those things, all right? And so not only was he selfish and all about himself, uh, strongest man, all this other kind of stuff, his walking away from God brought him into utter ruin. But you know the, the thing that... Uh, that um, Samson did that changed everything his dying uh, activity was he was able to defeat defeat the enemies of God you know how he did that he prayed he prayed he got his hands on uh, the uh, the Colosseum columns and he prayed and he asked God to do one thing for him and God responded and so we need to be people of prayer. I got one more announcement and then we'll move to our study. And that is our 1030 worship service. All right. Our 1030 worship service. I want to I want to just share that there are there are four things or four ways that you can connect to us uh, on our our 1030 a.m. worship. All right. Uh, one way, of course, is through our, our sanctuary. OK, that's kind of our big general uh, opening for our worship service. Now, during that time, you know, masks are optional. As y'all been here and you've seen that, uh, masks are optional. They're recommended, especially if, if you're more comfortable wearing a mask. Man, by all means, please do that and join us for worship. Uh, we have our, our pews that are blocked off, so there's, uh, we want to encourage social distancing. All right. Uh, the second way that you can uh, get involved in worship is our gymnasium, which is a huge space. It is open with chairs and tables so that you can watch live streaming. You can watch our worship services if you want a little bit more elbow room, you know what I mean? As a matter of fact, a couple of our small groups are going to be going out there every week because we want to be sure that there's plenty of room in the sanctuary for more of our members who are coming back to church as well as guests. So I'm so excited about that. So the gym is open for you and masks are, are optional, highly recommended if you feel more comfortable wearing them, okay? And then we have our coffee shop, which is where I'm at right now. In our coffee shop, uh, since it is a smaller space, uh, this is reserved for people, uh, for masks only. All right, so masks are required in here. And this is for people who would feel so much more comfortable worshiping with people with masks on, okay? So uh, I hope that that made sense to you, those three, which brings me to number four. Number four, our services are still online. There's between 50 and 100 people that are watching our services online, and I'm just so excited about that. Listen, if you have a weakened immune system or you're more prone to, uh, to getting uh, illnesses of those natures, um, or if you may have been exposed to somebody who has an illness uh, in the past couple of weeks, man, we want to encourage you to worship with us online. All right, all right. Well, let's uh, dive into our our worship. I want to be just clear though: masks are optional. They're they're recommended if it's more comfortable for you, but the masks are mandatory in the coffee shop at the 1030 hour. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump into our uh, study for tonight. Uh, if you have your app or uh, you have 
uh, a way to get into our online uh, website. I'm going to read to you our statement of faith concerning the family. All right, now this will be a two-part message. All right, before I do that, let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your awesomeness. God, that you are good to us, Lord, all the time. All the time, you're good. And God, I thank you that we had this opportunity to kind of dig into your word and to uh, just be solidified on what you say about marriage and family. Uh, God, help us to be faithful, not to redefine something that you have clearly stated. Help us not to reimagine what you have beautifully imaged. Uh, and God, may, us, may we uh, be so faithful to walk the path that you have laid out for us in your scripture. God, you're perfect. Your ways are perfect. Your word is perfect. And God, help us to be faithful to abide to it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in our statement of faith, it says this about the family. We believe God has ordained the family as the foundational institution of human society. Foundational. You have government that came about sometime after Genesis 9. Uh, you have the church that came at Pentecost, all right? But before even sin entered the world, the institution that God ordained or God put together is marriage. So uh, we believe that God ordained the family as the foundational institution of human society, okay? The foundational institution of human society. It is composed of persons related to one another by marriage, by blood or adoption. We believe marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman in covenant commitment for a lifetime. It is God's unique gift to reveal the union between Christ and his church and to provide for the man and the woman in marriage the framework for intimate companionship, the channel of sexual expression according to the biblical standards is the means, or, and, excuse me, the means for procreation of the human race. We believe the husband and wife are of equal worth before God, since both are created in the image of God. The marriage relationship models the way God relates to his people. The husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and he has the God-given responsibility to provide for, to protect, and to lead his family. The wife is to submit herself graciously to the servant leadership of her husband, even as the church willingly submits to the headship of Christ. She, being in the image of God, as is her husband, and thus equal to him, has the God-given responsibility to respect her husband and to serve as his helper in managing the household and the nurturing of the next generation. We believe children are, from the very moment of conception, a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. Parents are to demonstrate to their children God's pattern for marriage. Parents are to teach their children spiritual and moral values and to lead them through consistent lifestyle example uh, and loving discipline to make choices based on biblical truth. Children are to honor and obey their parents. All right, so we're going to cover about uh, half of the marriage part uh, today. Next time we'll cover, well, we're going to actually cover about three-fourths of it today. And then next time we'll cover the ending part of marriage and the children. All right, so uh, let's just dive in. All right, biblical understanding of marriage. That's what I want to cover right now. All right, I want to cover uh, five points uh, tonight. All right, marriage, first and foremost, is defined by God. Marriage is defined by God. In Genesis 2.24, the scripture says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. All right, so that is how God defined marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, if you just got a definition of marriage from that, uh, some would say, well, that's an antiquated, uh, an old definition of marriage. Jesus, uh, what does Jesus have to say about marriage? Well, I'm glad you asked. In Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 3 through 6, the scripture says that Jesus answered, Have you not read, he who created them from the beginning, 
So if he created it, then uh, he's got authority over what to have and what to, uh, to do. Uh, God made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. All right, so that was Jesus in the scriptures defining marriage. Jesus in the scripture defining marriage. So here's how God defines marriage. All right, it is a covenant between one man and one woman for life. All right. A covenant between one man and one woman for life. Number two, not only has God defined marriage, marriage is ordained by God. Marriage is ordained by God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 to 24, here's what the scripture says. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed it up in its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. All right. So in this passage, we see that God is the originator and he is the establisher, originator and establisher of the institution of marriage. All right. God gives the plan. All right. Many of us think that maybe God started the plan and then we are here to perfect it. No. He is the author and perfecter of all things, including our faith, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. So God is the originator and the establisher of the institution of marriage. God's plan is perfect. God's plan is perfect. And what's the plan? Leave. Leave the authority of your parents and then cleave all right, to spousal responsibilities, leave, cleave, become one. Number three, a biblical understanding of marriage declares that marriage brings completion. Marriage brings completion. Now, I want to be very careful to say this. There are some people here, all right, in our own church, as well as people outside, that have a special gift called celibacy. All right? They don't need to get married. All right? But even then, even if you have the gift of celibacy, we need each other for completeness. We do. All right? That's why God ordained the body of Christ. All right? Even if you're celibate, all right? even if you don't need a husband or a wife, you need the church. And the church needs you. All right? So with that said, uh, marriage brings Completion. We're talking on a general scale here. Here, marriage brings completion. All right. In Genesis chapter two, verse eighteen, the scripture says, "Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him." All right. A helper. It's the same word that's used in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit. All right. Someone who comes alongside you. All right. A best friend. All right, that, that's what's going on here, okay? Uh, my wife is my best friend, and I'm her best friend. Okay, so there's a helper relationship. And he says, I will make a helper fit for him, which means fit meanings uh, suitable, okay? Suitable. It's exactly what we need. We need each other. So that's absolutely beautiful. And here's what this statement says to all believers, all right? We cannot live life alone. We cannot live life alone. One commentator said it this way. He said, without female companionship and partnership, man could not fully realize his humanity. And it's the same way the other way, right? A woman uh, 
without male companionship and partnership, she cannot fully realize her humanity. All right. So I guess what I'm saying is this. We're a lot more dependent than we think. All right. Doesn't matter your sex. We're all in need of each other. <laughs> wow. In Genesis uh, uh, 2, verse 19 and 20, the scripture says, Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and the birds uh, and of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So what happened before the creation of Eve, here's what we had. Every animal went to Adam to be named. All right. And every name that he gave every animal uh, whether it was aardvark, antelope, uh, zebra. I went from A to Z real quick, didn't I? All right. But in everything that went around him, every name he gave was like saying, not like me. Every animal that came by, not like me, not like me. None of these were suitable to be my friend. Okay. Now, I know dogs are man's best friend, right? Well, that's not, that's not true from God's perspective. All right. So nothing uh, was going to uh, be what Adam needed, all right? Man needed live, physical, human companionship. No animal could meet his needs. Only woman could meet his needs. And only man can meet woman's needs. Again, we cannot live without you. Ladies, we cannot live without you. And to the ladies, we can't, you, we can't live without men. That's the way that we're built, all right? So, again, I'm going to make a general statement. Celibacy is a wonderful gift for some, but it wasn't for Adam. Added, Adam needed companionship, all right? So in Genesis 2, 21 through 23, the scripture says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, God took one of the ribs closed it up in its place with flesh. After he woke up, listen to what he said, when, when God brought the woman to the man, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me. So all the animals that he saw, not like me, not like me, but when he woke up and he saw Eve as God in his ordaining awesome ability, he brought Eve to Adam he said, like me, like me, finally a friend, someone with the same thing that I have on the inside, all right, the ability to have relationship with God and somebody like me. Wow, that is powerful. One commentator said, when it comes to the relationship between man and woman, uh, specifically Adam and Eve and generally us, she is not above me. She is not beneath me. She is like me. All right? And together, we fulfill the roles that God has given us on the earth. Bear the image of God. Care over his creation for all generations. <laughs> wow, that is so amazing. And so what this tells us then is since Adam and Eve is the first, the foundation of community, that tells us this, the strength of a community is absolutely and totally based on marriage and marital fidelity. All right? You want a strong nation, you got to have a strong community. If you want a strong community, you got to have strong families. All right? So that's what we're about. All right? And with the issue of sex. All right. Marriage also provides the proper expression of sex. Proper sexual expression is found in marriage. So then, marriage, uh, excuse me, sex, instead of being something that is evil, which many people uh, may try to, uh, from a religious standpoint, say it's evil. No, 
Listen, the Bible affirms sexual intimacy as a gift from God. All right? Paul taught that, that husbands and wives, we have this beautiful and mutual responsibility relative to sexual fulfillment. We see that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right? So within the context of marriage, the act of sex is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Outside of that, according to Hebrews chapter 13, uh, if you have either adultery that can uh, rob and dishonor marriage, okay, uh, or actually defile marriage, or if you have sexual immorality, sex outside of the covenant of marriage, then, of course, you have uh, the dysfunction of marriage, okay? You have a dishonor and then a, a destruction, uh, really, destruction of marriage. And so um, that brings us to number four. Marriage is the foundation of family, but also community. Marriage is the foundation of family and community. Um, what was the first crisis in Scripture? What was the first crisis in Scripture? Here's what it was. In Genesis 2.18, then the Lord God said, it is not good, something is not good. Out of everything being good that he created, he said, something is not good. And that is that man should be alone. It is not good that man should be alone. That's why he makes a helper fit for him. Question, was Adam utterly alone? Was he truly all by himself? No. He had a great relationship with God. All right. And, of course, he had all the animals, right, around him. Yet something was missing. Even though he had a fulfilling relationship with God, uh, God knew that he needed human contact. All right, He knew that he needed a, a horizontal relationship, not just vertical. All right? Uh, and also, Fido is not enough. All right? You, see, you need something more than man's best friend, all right? And so you and I were created for relationship with God and with one another. Without each other, we are incomplete. Without each other, we're incomplete. And so the foundational human relationship is marriage, all right? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, the scripture says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we were made for relationship with each other, and marriage is that covenantal relationship that says this. We're made for each other, yes, but I am committed to, to staying no matter what. That is the foundation of family and community. One man, one woman for life. Now, I do want to make just one statement about the fact that not all marriages end this way, all right? Uh, for better, for worse, rich or poor, till death do us part. Sometimes a marriage does not last a lifetime. I want to be very clear and say that God understands our weak, our hard hearts. He understands that. Some of us have been so hurt from the devastation of, of sexual sin or from abandonment or desertion, uh, abuse, that I, I believe Matthew 19 declares that God understands. God understands. All right, so if you have suffered through divorce, know this. Uh, God understands. All right, we even read in the book of Jeremiah that God himself uh, had to divorce himself from his people because uh, of their depravity went too far. 
All right, so, and God welcomes back, praise God. Uh, he's bigger, he's better than us. But know this, God understands, all right? But, but the heart of God is one man, one woman for life, all right? And so that's what we preach. That's what we teach because it's God's word, all right? And number five, I'll close with this for today. Uh, number five is marriage is a picture to the world of sacrificial love. Marriage is a picture to the world or should be a picture to the world of sacrificial love. All right. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 8, uh, the scripture says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy, nor does it boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not insist on its own way. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? Doesn't, uh, excuse me, I think the thing may have frozen. Let me just make sure we're good. All right. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I don't know if it froze or not, so let me just start from the beginning of this. All right. Marriage is a picture to the world of sacrificial love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 8 says this. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. All right. Um, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endure all, endures all things. Love never ends. All right. So, the Christ-centered marriage, that's what we're, we're thinking about, all right? That's what we're doing. Uh, the, the, uh, the ideal, okay, the desire of the believers, all right? When we're thinking about uh, the ideal marriage, the Christ-centered marriage, it should not ever be seen as a place of envy, a place of boasting and arrogance or, or rudeness uh, or irritability, or resentfulness, okay? Marriages should not be seen as my way or the highway, all right? Instead, marriages should be seen as a place of, of patience and kindness, about rejoicing in the truth, not rejoicing in wrongdoing. All right? Marriages are about spouses that, that bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. Marriages should, they should not end. Because what we're going to find out next week is that the purpose of marriage is not primarily about our happiness. All right? The purpose of marriage is primarily for the child of God. Just like everything else we do, the purpose of marriage is to glorify God. If that is the focus of the husband and the wife, then the world will begin to see a more accurate picture of God and they can more accurately know on who to call on for help in their own life and relationships. Isn't that the desire of us Christians? Okay, to be that type of salt and light by the way that we work? The way that we talk, the way that we walk, the way that we handle adversity, the way we handle relationships, the way we treat our spouses, the way we treat our children. Everything about us, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever, we do all for the glory of God. So anyways, that's part one. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, how marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. And we'll talk about uh, the relationship and the role of children. All right. So with that said, uh, keep in mind, we got the prayer vigil. Uh, please sign up for that so that we, our goal is to make 24 hours straight of there to be constant prayer. 
and we'll have we'll have uh, prayer lists out there for you. So don't think if you're going to sign up for a 30 minute slot, can I pray for 30 minutes? We'll give you more than enough things to pray for. All right, during that time. All right, and invite a friend to come with you. Y'all pray together. Okay, uh, bring your family. Uh, I think that'd be wonderful uh, as we all gather together and as parents, which I'll talk about next week. As parents, be the example of what it means to be a Christ follower. Uh, even in our prayer life. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, hope to see you Sunday. All right. Bye-bye.